That's not necessarily a good thing to say, but desserts are so unnecessary. It's, <laughs> um, and it's, it's you know you don't need dessert for any other reason than enjoyment. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Earlier in the year, when we spoke to Mark Best. He talked about the importance of knowing every section of a kitchen to help form a complete chef. How new chefs to his brigade at Mark would be thrown into the pastry section to refine their skills and understand its precision and beauty. But what does it take to become a great pastry chef? Lauren Eldridge is the head pastry chef of Parara Waters Inn. Lauren, how are you going? Hi, I'm good, thank you. You've uh, worked at some pretty incredible restaurants all over the world, which we can get to, but Barara Waters Inn has magical, iconic status in Australia's food history. How does it feel to become part of that history? I'm very excited about going there. When I went there for lunch a couple of months ago, I walked in and I just thought, I have to be here. There's something about it. that There's a real pull to that place when you get there. It's just a beautiful surrounds and restaurant. You've uh, worked with Mark Best, who sort of told us that he likes to throw his chefs into the pastry section when they first went to Mark. Um, what, what was it like in those days working as a, as a pastry chef at Mark and Pay Modern? So I got a lot of benefit from chefs having to be thrown into pastry. Uh, when I started, I was still an apprentice. I think I just started my second year when I went to Mark. Um, and because he didn't actually employ actual pastry chefs. I was like, oh, well, are you sure you want me, (laughs) basically? And I think part of the reason he said yes is because I was so green. So it was easy for him to just mould what he needed out of me. And because all of these savoury chefs would come in, he would give them three-month time periods where they had to go in and run the section. And you could see some of them were – just like, I don't want to do this and I'm stuck in there with this apprentice who knows nothing. But it meant I got to work with a lot of amazing chefs over my first sort of nine months um, who went on to do amazing things and open their own restaurants or be head chefs in all these fantastic restaurants. Um, But for me, it was the first real restaurant I had been in. So I just thought this was normal. That's how all chefs were. (laughs) Uh, And then after that nine months, there was sort of no more chefs to filter back through and Mark just decided that I was just going to be in there by myself. Um, I think at the time I was, you know, very flattered and thought I was just absolutely great but also terrified. What I Looking back, he obviously had a very short leash (laughs) on what I was allowed to do. (laughs) Um, But I think going through that process and then being put in there by myself, there was a lot of pressure. We had three hats at the time and I was like, how am I as an apprentice suddenly the sole pastry chef of a three-hat restaurant? Um, And that's the way I saw it, whether or not that was reality for the first few years. Um, But having that mindset, I think, absolutely pushed me to be better and better and the standard had to be high. So that was just how I learned. What did you learn from that time about actual pastry and and constructing dishes um, under the influence of so many incredible chefs? I learned, I was, I mean, I was still at TAFE at the time um, and I think TAFE, I was sole pastry course at TAFE and there was a lot of technique driven things, but I suppose older technique and um, Mark was not that kind of restaurant. So I was able to get a very good balance of the standard pastry technique. And then I would go into work and Mark would ask for something. I'll go, I want this dish, figure out how to make it happen. Um, And I just had to figure out how to make it happen. So a lot of that came from reading um, And Mark always sort of says, you know, he was self-taught and he did that to all of his chefs. So for me, it was like, well, I better just figure it out. Um, 
we had the Friday lunch, Mark Friday lunch, and every week it was a different dish. So every week there was a deadline of something that had to be produced just to add to the pressure. <laughs> um, so I had, you know, I knew that I had seven days or six days, whatever it was, to figure out a dish, and that meant trialling new techniques, reading about ingredients, all of this sort of thing, and it was a lot of the time just me and, you know, he would stick his head in and be like, well, why don't you try this? Or I would talk to one of the other chefs. And over time that really helped me learn pastry. Um, but I think learn it from a really different viewpoint um, to a lot of pastry chefs. And I think it worked in my benefit to be trained by savory chefs and then be self-taught in that way. Um, so obviously I was reading a lot of pastry books and learning technique and ideas and things that way, but it was, my lens was different that I was looking through. Um, so I think sometimes I feel like there is a little bit of a gap in my knowledge because I've never worked in a full patisserie or chocolate shop or any of this sort of thing, a bakery, nothing like that, <laughs> but it's given me a very clear direction, um, and style. So it was it was a unique way to learn to be a pastry chef, but I think has really benefited me. Where did the interest in food begin for you and why why a career in pastry? My whole family has always been interested in food and my parents love to cook um, and are both good cooks. The pastry component, I, don't, I think it's more in my nature to be quite precise. Um, I'm quite a just naturally quite a precise minimalistic like everything has its place that's just how I am so I also like to understand why things are happening you know um and with pastry there's it's very clear why certain things happen and why they don't and if you to me it was like well this isn't hard it was like you follow the recipe and you get the result there was no it never made sense to me that people say oh, pastry is hard because as a child you would just, my parents would be like, oh, here's a, you know, cake recipe from a book. Do you want to make this? And me and my mum would make it and then you'd get a cake at the end. And it was just very <laughs> straightforward for me. Um, and I think I've probably, you know, been doing that since I was seven or eight. So that then that just came from my mum liked to cook. Her mum liked to cook. It was just something that was done. And then as a child being told by your parents or your grandparents or whoever's around that, oh, you're really good at this, which God knows if I was, but they told me I were. So it just built my confidence in that one particular area. Um, and I think food was just something that was always around and we always talk about and still we will go out for family dinners and inevitably the conversation just ends up being about food. Um, but none of my family work in hospitality. It's just me, <clears throat> uh, my immediate family anyway. So it's just a natural thing for me to make pastries. I didn't have any interest in cooking savoury food at home. <laughs> you know, I think it was as a kid I wanted to eat cookies and cakes and slices and all that stuff that were treats. So I learned how to make them. <laughs> Your uh, time at, at Mark and Pay Modern led to uh, some of the best restaurants in the world. Tell, tell us about some of the restaurants and, and what you got out of them because it's it's like a, a dream, your CV for many chefs. Yeah, I think after Mark, um, well, I won the Josephine Pinulay Award when I was at Mark, so that gave me an opportunity to travel. I also won um, the Gomeo it was called Potentialist of the Year back then, and that gave me an opportunity to go to France. So there was, in France, two restaurants I worked at, um, both three Michelin stars. So I worked at Guy Savoie and Le Sanc, and they were both, I've murdered that pronunciation. I apologise to any French speakers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, they were both stages and just over a week each. So it was very sort of short and sweet, but having the backing of... Gomeo in France, I mean, it's not massive in Australia as a guide, but in France it's huge. So being able to walk in there um, and they knew that I was coming with the guide gave me a lot of 
opportunities and they really kind of nurtured me and showed me what they're all about. So it was a very intense week. Um, I think being in those two restaurants, the very French brigade style restaurants, particularly the one in the Four Seasons, it was very intimidating. Um, they were the, well, the one in the Four Seasons was the sort of kitchen where you were concerned that someone was going to like sabotage your whatever you were doing to make themselves look better. It was um, very, diff- very different to being in um, the Australian kitchens I had been in particularly Mark where I was by myself um, most of the time in this pastry kitchen and I've gone into this huge, huge pastry kitchen with massive teams. Um, But I think I learned, in my mind, I was like, oh, well, you know, this is how three Michelin star restaurants must be. A couple of months later, I went to Italy uh, and I worked at Osteo Francescana for two, two and a half months. And it was like a completely different world. The again, three mission stars, and when I was there, they won best restaurant in the world, which is fantastic timing. Um, but they were so relaxed and they were so nice. And they would the first the first day I got there, I I think I started at say I don't know eight thirty or nine thirty, and I got there at quarter past. And I was outside the restaurant and there was no one there. There was no one in the street. There was no one inside. And I was like, I've got the day wrong. I was like, oh, what am I going to like? Am I late? Am I early? Where is everyone? And then people just sort of started trickling in really slowly. Um, the the actual employees as opposed to the stagiaires would go in, they'd have a coffee, they'd all, you know, stand outside and kick a soccer ball around and then go in and do some work. <laughs> And then about 11, 11.30, they would go and um, you'd have lunch and they would cook staff meal for everybody. You'd go back in and do service. After service, everyone would go on an hour to an hour and a like, hour to two hour break and go home and then come back and do dinner service um, and have dinner as well. There would also be dinner. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> so I just had this idea that you would go in there and you'd be worked crazy hours and everyone would be super intense and they were just so chill. Um, and I think it really influenced how I thought kitchens needed to be run. And there was, there was a, I suppose, a push in Australia and it's more so now to change the culture and the hours and all that sort of thing and how we run kitchens here. But I remember staying there and being like, this is the best restaurant in the world. If this is how they are, why, like, to me, there was then no point for anybody to say, well, you need to, you need to be a bit harsh or you need to work these crazy hours to get results because it was clear that you didn't. (laughs) Um, So I learned, I think, a lot from being in two different countries and different styles of restaurants. And obviously they're very good restaurants or being three Michelin stars. Um, But I think it was just about what I decided to take from each of them. And Massimo's style is very story, like all about telling a story, whereas all of the French food was very technique driven. So it was good to see both, both types. You returned to Australia and um, joined the Van Handel group um, overseeing many restaurants. Tell us about that role and what it was like trying to create the pastry offering for such different restaurants. Yeah, so I, when I came back from overseas, well, when I was overseas, Mark closed. So I sort of came back unemployed, <laughs> um, which was a bit of a surprise. I wasn't expecting it. And I was in Sydney for a few months and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Mark had been such a special place and a unique place that, There was nothing there at the time. There was sort of fine dining restaurants closing left, right and centre. And I got a phone call from the Van Handel group and at first I was like, well, they're in Melbourne. So, I mean, I'll I'll entertain the conversation, but that's not going to happen because I'm not leaving Sydney. Um, And they were just, what they were offering was something completely different and I 
at first I was like, well, I want the same thing, but I realized that was never going to happen. And Mark was actually the one that was like, you know, don't be an idiot. You need to take this job. So the job itself was group pastry chef and they hadn't, they were sort of creating the position. Um, It was a new position within the group. So there was obviously clear directions and what they wanted, but also a bit of flexibility. And it was up to me to figure out how this position was going to work uh, for the group. And so there was two Stokehouse restaurants, which were higher end. There was an Italian sort of bar cantina, and then there was a beachside restaurant. So very different styles. Uh, What I learned, I think the best part about being there for me was how structured a group was compared to coming from a very small restaurant that was, I mean, Mark won a lot of accolades, but at the end of the day, it was a small business owned by a husband and wife. (laughs) And going to Van Handel Group, you know, four venues, Frank Van Handel had been a Melbourne name and owned multiple restaurants for, you know, 30 years. Um, And so there was a lot of structure. There was a lot of, I don't want to say corporate mentality, but they were doing things like staff appraisals or sending me on management courses. And to me, that wasn't how kitchens were. And I really struggled for the first probably nine months because I just thought, well, this isn't what a kitchen environment is about. And over time, I realized how many benefits there were to actually operating like this. You know, I was like, why why do I have to answer emails? I'm a chef. And then it was just, you know, it didn't make sense to me. I just wanted to cook some food. And being there taught me a lot about how to manage people. So I was there for three and a half years in total. So I learned a lot about time management, working across four restaurants, a lot about managing people, working with three different or four different head chefs as well because each venue had its own head chef um, and I had to fit into that. So I was absolutely doing my own thing, but I had to work with them and their teams in each different venue. Um, So that was a really great opportunity. In terms of my food style, it was one of the first times that I'd been just left to my own devices. (laughs) So at Mark, where I sort of developed all of this style and learnt a lot and was self-taught, there was always this safety net. You know, Mark was the chef owner, so that meant he had a lot of say in the food because he was a chef, whereas this was a businessman running a business. I was He employed me to be creative, so then it was on me to be creative. And it took me a while, I think, to find my own style and that was probably more stokehouse driven than the other venues. But they were so supportive about it. They were like, well, this is, you know, I say it's supportive. It was also good business for them. They were like, well, that's your job. That's what we've employed you to do. So go and do it. Um, but for me, there was no there was no safety net. If I couldn't come up with something, well, that was on me. So it really taught me how to be creative in a structured environment, which I think is going to be a massive benefit in any job I have in the future. You mentioned that you found your style while uh, with the Van Handel group. Um, Tell us a bit about what your style is and if you have a dish or two that you could run through to give us an an idea of um, the sort of dishes that you're creating. I think I'm very – I consider it very simple – in terms of appearance and flavour, um, or sorry, not flavour, ingredients. <laughs> uh, as with any chef that you're going to talk to, I'm sure they're going to tell you taste is first and foremost what you need to consider. I always look at the produce available first, um, but when I'm creating a dish, it ends up like there's an image in my head I sort of, I'm a terrible drawer, but like I'll I'll attempt to scribble something on a piece of paper um, and go, that's what I want to create. And then I, that's just how I start. I think very visually. 
and then figure out, you know, oh, well, peaches are in season. So I'm going to use a peach. Maybe it'll work in this image that I have. And, you know, there's lots of different things floating around in my head. Um, and what sort of ingredients going to go where. And then from my time at Mark, it was all about getting the most out of that ingredient. And so my style ends up being maybe one ingredient used multiple ways on the dish um, because that was how I was taught. Like how do you get everything out of an ingredient or make this better, which at Stokehouse they were really, they're very uh, into no waste and they're a five-star green rated energy building. So it was also a way to minimize waste, which is something that I've always done. I think five years ago I was doing it because it was economical and it pushed me to be creative. And now there's the, you know, the environmental impact is first and foremost in a lot of chefs' minds. Um, I think that style just lends itself to being a bit minimalistic and I never like calling my food that because I don't think anybody's like oh that sounds delicious minimalism but (laughs) but it's just um my aesthetic I suppose more than anything I think a really good example of that in terms of a dish is the Neapolitan dish I did at Stokehouse um which is just three the three layers obviously the three different colors that you get in Neapolitan ice cream Um, but each of them are formed into a square and then just stacked on top of each other. There's nothing else on the plate. There's no other garnish. It's just very like three very clean, simple colored squares. And for me, it's a perfect example of what I like to be able to do in that it tastes delicious. Um, There's a lot of technique in it. It looks very clean uh, and they're sort of, three things that I focus on. So that I think is a really good example of my style. Um, I hope to be able to bring it to Sydney as well to, you know, it was such a Melbourne dish at the time, but I'll be able to bring it up here and put it on at Barara so people can see it. I think it's a good way to show people what I intend to do at Barara, not (laughs) Not dishes I've done before, but I guess introduce my style to the restaurant. Barrera Waters Inn has had some of Australia's most talented chefs and legends uh, through its doors and in its kitchens. Um, how, how have you approached your role um, leading up to the start at Barrera Waters and, and what you're going to do on the menu? Yeah, I think the the names of the chefs, when you look at who has worked there, um, It can be quite intimidating. So I think being there is quite special and being able to make my mark on it. Um, Brian, the owner, chef, and I get along really, really well. And his, I guess, desire is that the menu becomes sort of 50-50 or 60-40 with pastry and savoury. So he just wants, he wants to, you know, like give it to me and just let me do my own thing. Um, And his way of saying it is, well, if you're here, like you're here for a reason and this is going to be it. And it also allows him to focus on what he's really good at, which is the savory side. So what I've been, I mean, I start in a couple of weeks, but to me it's about getting that cohesiveness between the two. two people to just making it work as one solid menu, making it work with its surroundings and trying to translate what's turning into a really good friendship onto a menu. Um, And then that also includes working with the sommeliers and the bar team and they've got some really great coffee and teas locally sourced and it's about everything working together. So that's my main, that's absolutely my main focus. Um, and then at the same time, I think I want people to go there and go, yes, this is a Lauren Eldridge dish, but it's me at Barara, you know, the sort of work. I don't want it to just be something that could go in any restaurant I work in. I want it to match with Barara and Brian and the whole team there. What do you think is so magical about a dessert and, and what what makes a great dessert from your perspective? I think – 
That's not necessarily a good thing to say, but desserts are so unnecessary. It's, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, you don't need dessert for any other reason than enjoyment. Um, you don't really need it for sustenance unless you can't eat anything else, which is very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> um, and I think that's what makes them so good. It's just people are ordering them. People are eating them purely because of enjoyment and they want to eat something delicious and they know it's a little bit like, oh, I don't need it, but I'm going to have it anyway. It's why people have dessert stomachs. Um, so I think I love that about them. I think it gives me a lot of creative freedom because there's no there's no rules with any of this it's just you don't need to fit into a box with desserts it can just be whatever somebody wants to eat um yeah i think that's what makes them so special your uh, new role is multifaceted there's a lot of elements to it but um what what do you love about what you do for a career i think when i joined hospitality I didn't really see it for a long time as a career and then when I first sort of walked into a kitchen the very first kitchen I walked in I remember I was washing dishes and I was just like this this is the best place in the world like my hand full of, like in dirty water I was like how great is this um I think a lot of chefs will say the same thing you go in there and it just feels right and for me, being a pastry chef just feels right. It's what I've always enjoyed to do. And it's that gut feeling, that gut instinct of knowing that this is what makes me happy, truly happy and content. And creating as well, like being creative and making these dishes, I don't realize how much I'm missing it um, until I actually start doing it again so being in Melbourne last year there was a long period of time where I wasn't working and obviously that was very difficult time but I didn't realize how much I missed making desserts until I went back into the kitchen and could create something that feeling I get when I see a dish on the plate and I'm happy with it and people around me are eating it and saying how delicious it is that's you know that absolutely fuels me and I really need that um and I didn't realize how much I needed it until there was that period where I didn't have it. But it, it's just, it just feels right and it makes me happy. And that, that's why I became a pastry chef in the first place is because I enjoyed it and it made me happy. So I think that's just, that's just what it is for me. Well, as you mentioned, the role at Barara Waters Inn starts in a couple of weeks for you. What are you, what are you most looking forward to when you get there? I'm really excited to be able to take what I've learnt in lots of different venues and put it into this role. I think obviously I was saying when I was at Mark, I was really green when I started. And then when I went to Stoke House, it was such a different way of thinking for me that it was such a learning curve that whole time um, in both restaurants that have been, you know, the major restaurants that I've been in for most of my career, um, I think been a chef just over 10 years and it's probably nearly eight years in just those two restaurants so to take both of those experiences and be walking into Burrell with that knowledge I think I've got the best of both worlds um and going into a place that is so iconic and feeling within myself that yeah now I've got more of a style I've got some really great basis in terms of management um, and people skills and learning how different types of kitchens operate. That's I'm just excited to be able to go in with that in the back of my mind and create new food in that environment. Well, Lauren, it's very exciting and uh, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are very excited of the fact that you'll be there as head pastry chef at um, one of Australia's very best and most iconic restaurants. We've loved hearing your story today on Deep in the Weeds. Good luck when you get there. I'm sure you don't need it. Um, please, please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Great. Thank you for having me on. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. 
Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.